thank you for those. I uh, see a few guests here this morning. I pray, Lord, that uh, even though this maybe is not a church home for them, that they might uh, just really sense your presence here and hear from you, um, no matter what their age, uh, that they would hear you speaking to them this morning through your word and by your Holy Spirit. I pray for those who are part of this body, Lord, that you would uh, stir our hearts uh, just to, to love you more passionately and, and fervently, just as uh, you are worthy of that, Lord. And uh, so I pray you'd work in our midst today. We, we lift up this time. I uh, pray you would use it. We, we love you and thank you in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, um, you know, it's kind of uh, normal uh, um, teaching, kind of a tool to begin with some sort of a question, kind of get you thinking, you know, figure where, wherever you're coming from this morning. Uh, maybe you had an argument on the way into church or, you know, maybe coffee was messed up at Starbucks or something like that, you know, so, um, so you, know, you come in and you might, you might have a thousand things going on in your head, so to, to just get you thinking along the, learn, the long lines of where we're headed this morning, I'll start with this, this is a simple question for you, and it's, it's obvious you can answer this very easily for yourself, but, you, you know, do you consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus? Um, that's, that's not necessarily the term that we use most frequently in, in our culture, it's kind of like I'm a believer, uh, but you, you do realize that there, there's people who believe, or at least they would say they do, that don't follow. And, and so uh, this is really, uh, if you think of the term disciple, are you a disciple of Jesus? Some of us, honestly, when we, we think we read the Bible a little bit, we hear about the disciples, we think of that as like a high title, and we go, ah, you know, I'm not really comfortable calling myself a disciple. Well, if you understand what the word really means, it's not, it's not intended to be a high title it's a descriptive title and it's a, it really means to be somebody who's a learner uh, in it kind of in a sense a trainee you're being trained by Jesus you're learning from him and that is what we're called to be according to Matthew we're supposed to go and make disciples of all nations so it's, it's more than just being a believer it's it's being a someone who follows and who's being taught or learning from Jesus you think well how do I do that now well by his word and by his spirit he, he teaches us and leads us, and we're supposed to, we have this living relationship with him, and so it, there's a, should be a connection to being led by him, and you can see that's kind of a central part of this passage we're going to look at, and it's an important uh, thing for us to answer that question for ourselves. Um, we're, we're, the gospel is, uh, means good news, and there's four of them that are in the Bible, uh, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're in Matthew, obviously, which is Literally, it's Matthew recording or telling us the, the story of Jesus, the, the life, his coming, his fulfillment of prophecy, his teachings and miracles, and we'll see that as we go through the gospel. And, uh, and then it culminates with his death uh, for our sins and his resurrection and then him, him ascending into heaven. So it's really the good news about who he is and what, 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 what's he all about. So... Since we're in the beginning of the book, we're kind of at the beginning of his life, the beginning of his story. So if you're wondering what, what are we covering this morning, well, uh, we're, we're covering the, the events that take place shortly after his baptism by John the Baptist. That was kind of a central thing, and the Holy Spirit descends in, in a visible form upon him and remains on him. And then a voice from heaven, the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then last week we saw that he immediately went out and spent a period of time being tempted by the devil, uh, showing his victory over sin and, and the devil, and, and also giving us encouragement because he faced the kinds of things that we face, and he, he could do it victoriously. And so there's hope for us to go, hey, Lord, could you help me out with this stuff? Right? But then we go on, and as we begin this chapter, we're going to see that uh, John the Baptist is arrested. And that kind of sets the tone here. And you might think, why, why, would, why would anybody arrest John the Baptist? He's baptizing people in the wilderness, you know, not really bothering anybody, except he was preaching a message of repentance from sin. And that happened to offend a politician. What a surprise, <laughs> right? Uh, but this politician, Herod, actually was very offended because he was involved in, uh, you know, some immoral stuff. And, and he didn't like being called out on it. So... He figured out a way with his power to arrest John, to shut him up, put him in jail, uh, prison, for actually a period of about a year, and then ultimately he's going to take his life. 
And so since John is, you know, very connected with Jesus and um, Herod is ruling in an area that is, we, we would describe it as the Galilee region, the area where the Sea of Galilee is, and that northern area. He's the ruler there. That's where John got arrested. And that that's, gives us a little insight into our Savior because the, it tells us here that when jo- Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he departed to Galilee. So you, you think, well, oh, there's persecution breaking out there. Maybe we should go the other way. Now, Jesus goes directly to the place where this guy, has, uh, uh, Herod, rules and where he had um, arrested John. It's kind of bold, courageous, um, you know, kind of cool thing for the Lord to do. And so then it says something in the very next verse that we kind of go, okay, Galilee, yeah, Nazareth. I suppose he would go to Nazareth. Nazareth, Nazareth was his hometown where he grew up. So it makes sense if he goes to Galilee, he would reasonably go to his hometown. It'd be like if you were out of the state or something like that and you came to Southern California and you're from Big Bear, you'd probably come to Big Bear. You know, got friends here, whatever. And it, it tells us, Luke tells us, some of the events that took place there. Uh, he, when he went to Nazareth, he went to his home synagogue, uh, which it kind of be like us, you know, coming home and going to church here. With, you know, this is your home church. So he goes to the synagogue there in Galilee, or in, in Nazareth, and it tells us that he was given the opportunity, it's kind of a customary thing, when you had a guest, a special guest visitor come in, and he, he'd been apart from, away from the city for a while, so he comes home, and it's like he's, a, he's our homeboy, you know, and he's, yeah, it's great to see you, Jesus, what you've been up to, well, you know, great, you know, chat, 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 I start the service, and part of the service was a, a scheduled reading of a text, and so they ask him as the honored guest to come up and read the text, it happens to be Isaiah chapter 61. Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And the, the whole declaration of the Messiah's role and ministry. And he reads that. And then he says, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And then he sits down, uh, making a very clear statement, I'm the Messiah. And they didn't respond very well to that. You know, we grew up with this guy, whatever, you know, things like that. And, you know, Jesus uses that as a example to say you know prophets not without honor except in his own town among his own people uh, they they have a hostility as they're proclaiming their godliness as they're rejecting the messiah kind of weird huh we're so godly how could you say that that's so presumptuous it's like you know, no, you're missing the messiah your messiah who's been promised now he's here and you reject him in the name of god so they, they actually get so upset about it that they uh, attempt to kill him they, went, they, they tried to throw him off a cliff. And so and when it says leaving Nazareth, it's because of that rejection that he left Nazareth. And then he goes and, and goes to the region, the area right around the Sea of Galilee. There's a city named Capernaum that was there. It tells us it was by the sea. Uh, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, the, tri- the tribal areas of Zebulun and Nath- Naphtali. There's your reference for Isaiah and, and Luke. Um, and it says this action of him going to Na- uh, Galilee was a fulfillment of prophecy that was given by Isaiah uh, about 900 years before Christ. So literal fulfillment. Isaiah spoke about it uh, and this is the fulfillment that the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, in Gal- Gen- Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region of the shadow of, and, and shadow of death, light has dawned. It's speaking about Jesus being there in their midst. And, and he, we know from the scriptures, he is the light of the world. What does he mean by that? Not, not a light bulb, you know, not that kind of thing. He's talking about the, the, the revelation of the character of God. He's God in the flesh. And light reveals, it, it, it illuminates, it shows truth and goodness and there's purity and Jesus is all of those things and you think about it in terms of human history how many people actually had the opportunity to see Jesus in the flesh it's it's a relatively small number in terms of human population over human history but these guys had the opportunity and it's it's absolutely it's a great light because 
Scripture uses the idea of darkness as something that's associated with moral evil, right? And spiritual evil and ignorance. A lack of information, a lack of truth, a lack, a lack of light. And so these guys are in darkness in the sense that they, they really don't know much about God. There's predominantly Gentile area. The, it's not a small number of people. Actually, they, according to history, there's uh, over 200 cities in the Galilee region area. And it's a beautiful, large lake full of fish, a lot of commerce that takes place there, uh, farmlands, beautiful countryside, and no less than 200 cities that had populations of 15,000 or more. So you're talking about an area that had about 3 or 4 million people in it. So it's a very populated area, a lot of Gentiles there, but also many Jews too. And yet, you think about it, don't we live in a, a time when we have a great amount of darkness in people's minds when it comes to God? They really don't know much about him. They, th they think they do. Some of them think they know a lot about God, and you go, oh, that's not true. That's a misunderstanding. I don't know where you got that from, but it's not accurate, it's not true. And that's one of the reasons that it's important for us to be solid in God's word so we can bring light to people and say, you know, you need to know this is what God's really like. Well, they had the opportunity to see God in the flesh. You know, I think there's a passage in the Old Testament where it says, we've, we've heard about God, but now we see. They had the opportunity to see this light, this revelation. He, he's, according to the book of Hebrews, he's the, the glory of God. He's the outshining, the, the revelation of the character of God that you go, God's awesome. Look, what, look at the way he treats people. Look at how he, he stands for righteousness and yet loves people. And you go, those are all things that are revealing about the character of God. They got to see Jesus. Uh, that's one of the great things about reading through the New Testament. We go, we get to see God in action. Well, we hear about compassion. God's compassionate. Okay, that's great. What does that mean? Then we get to read about him dealing with people who have failed and fallen and, and see his tenderness and compassion and ability to restore. And, and you go, that, that's what we're talking about. That, we see it now. And Jesus was there showing them the light of the glory of God, the, the truth, the character of God. Um, Jesus is the light of the world. John chapter 8, he, he claims that title. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. And then he says something about a true follower. He says, and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but they'll have the light of life. It's the idea that if we're followers of Jesus, he's, he's going to make a difference in our lives. We're not going to walk in ignorance or superstition or moral evil, but we're going to walk in the light of his truth. We're going to gain the benefit of his character and insight and wisdom and guidance because we're following him. And, and then he tells us in Matthew chapter 5, just the very next chapter, you know, flip the page kind of thing. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, he says, you are the light of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty comfortable with him being the light of the world. It seems a little intimidating because he says, you are the light of the world. But it's the idea that he makes the difference in us. And, and we walk in a relationship with him, and it, and it makes a difference. And then we have the opportunity and the responsibility to be light to the world to say this is how God can change your life it's a high calling it's a high responsibility but it's what Jesus said we are as believers as followers just you're going to be an example because there's people in darkness that don't know what God's like and it's it, it's enlightening to them to see when God changes us from sinners in my case being a jerk you know, and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change you. And that's going to be a testimony. That people say, wow, God can make a difference in people's lives. God does. He's real. And he, and he makes a difference in people's lives. Right? And he says, we're supposed to be that city that's not hidden. Not, don't, don't hide our lives. Right? So verse 17, he says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is kind of the specific message John the Baptist was bringing and it's the idea that hey God's working and he's about to bring the kingdom here meaning the authority of God you can be part of his kingdom but there's a problem you got to turn 
You've got to repent. You've got to turn from your own ways, turn from sin, and turn towards God. And the time to do it is now because the kingdom is near. It's at hand. Now, we, we know that Jesus came. He ministered for about three, three and a half years, something like that. And uh, then he died on the cross and rose from the grave. And after he rose from the grave, people could be born again. Right? New birth, new life, because he, he, had, he had paid the price for us. Okay? And then he ascended to heaven, and we see the, the church and people beginning to experience the kingdom of God, that God ruled over them, that he, by his spirit, takes up residence in their lives. He lives in them. And he says the first step towards that is to repent. And so he calls them to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, and as he's walking by the sea, seashore this day, he sees Simon, who is also called Peter. They, they had kind of this thing of having a Jewish name, and since it was a secular Greek culture, they also had a secular name, a non-religious one. So Simon Peter, Andrew, his brother, and they're casting a net into the sea because they're fishermen. You've got to shift your gears a little bit if you're a fisherman here. Because you know, we're freshwater people. We don't, we don't do nets. It's against the rules in California. So if you get in the ocean, I don't know, maybe different. But here you can't fish with nets. You've got to fish with a hook, right? That's not the way they fished. So get that out of your head. You know, I know some of you guys are really serious fishermen, but get it out of your head. We're talking about nets, casting nets. So these guys are fishermen. And Jesus says to them, follow me. He, in a sense, the, the literal translation is Come. Come, come and follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Now, please catch that. So I think it's a hugely important thing because we, th we tend to think as Christians that when we follow Jesus, the primary impact, the most important thing, the thing he really wants to do is just to change us and make us the light of the world. Yeah? Kind of like fix our lives and that's what it's all about. But you see here, he says, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. It's connected with following him. Right? And so these guys immediately leave their nets and follow him. I've got to give them credit, man. They, they, they walked away from their jobs and their families to follow Jesus. It's, it's pretty profound stuff, and they did it immediately. And this is not a unique thing just for those guys. Right? We, could, we can easily, I don't know if you guys do this kind of stuff, but sometimes when you read the Bible, you go, yeah, well, that was those guys, and that's not for us, and it was just for the disciples, and it's not for us. And it's like, wait a second, this is the same for you and I. Because if you're a believer, did you, did you hear God call you to follow him? Yeah? Okay. Did you respond? Yeah? Okay. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Yeah, okay, so, so then these, this, is, this is what he says. Look at this. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me. You see, that's the response to the call and say, I want to respond to that. I, I want to come after him. Okay, if that's any one of us, let him deny himself. Obviously, if we're going to be part of the kingdom of God, that means it's not my kingdom anymore. Right? I'm putting myself under his authority. It, he's king now. And so I have, to, I have to start with me not running the show anymore. I have to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him. And he said if we follow him, he'll make us fishers of men. That's part of his plan and purposes for our lives. Please notice in, in this presentation, I'm saying this because of the times in which we live, the, the gospel call was not an invitation to a better life, right? He didn't offer these guys a better life. What, what could he have offered them? We're going to wander around, have no possessions. Uh, ultimately, you're going to get crucified or killed like me. Uh, and uh, by the way, oh, yeah, what did you guys have going for yourselves? A good family business that makes enough money for us? We... We, you know, I mean, what are, you, what are you offering them? Sometimes that's because of marketing in our culture. That's the presentation of the gospel. Hey, if you become a Christian, everything will work out really good for you. 
Yeah, some of you guys are laughing, going, <laughs> that's not true. No, it, it's not, that's not the gospel. I mean, if you think about it, sometimes people are married and one of the couple gets saved. Does that make their marriage better? I mean, hopefully, but not necessarily. Sometimes the other partner goes, I, I'm not into this Jesus thing, and it makes it worse, right? And you go, okay, well, what about, what about this situation? What about that situation? What about a situation that com- somebody comes from a, a other religious kind of a background and they become a Christian? Does it make their life better? No, it, it actually makes it harder. So that's not the gospel. The gospel is not, hey, invite Jesus in your life and you'll become president. Who wants to be president, right? Yeah. No, I mean, you'll become famous. You'll become rich and famous. There are some people that, that share it that way, teach it that way. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus died for our sins, that we, we're facing an eternal judgment, and that he loved us enough to be willing to come and lay down his life to save us, and that whoever will put their trust in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel is the gospel about God's forgiveness and salvation and and ultimately heaven, and it's, it's not saying, hey, we want to make your life better, right? We, we think about it as it's the, the message is that God's kingdom is near. You can turn from sin, and you can become part of God's kingdom. He's making this available to you through the Messiah. These four guys, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, which we're going to see in, in the other two in just a second, these four guys are going to be going with Jesus as we read the next few uh, chapters. They're going with Jesus around Galilee. This is like the first missionary tour. Uh, he takes them and he's training them to become fishers of men. The next time they go to Galilee, there's going to be 12 disciples. And they're going to go with Jesus and they're going to make the ministry loop up there. And then the last time Jesus goes through the Galilee, Galilee region, uh, he sends the 12 disciples ahead of them, uh, ahead of him, and then he follows behind them. Do you see what's going on here? They're getting trained. To, to, they're learning to become fishers of men. He's given them the opportunity to, to do this, to practice, 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 which makes you m- better and better and better. Okay, so verse 21 Going on from there, he saw the other two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, John, and they were, they were in the boat with Zebedee, their father. They were mending their nets, and he calls them, and immediately they leave the boat and their father and follow him. Pretty, pretty stunning response. And Jesus goes all around Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the kingdom of the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, so preaching and teaching. Those are two different activities. Preaching is announcing or sharing information that people don't have. And certainly in our culture, I know preachers have a bad name. I'm sorry. I'm, I, I don't really think I'm much of a preacher. But yeah, I get cl- categorized in that group because you know, people don't like preachers too much. But the idea of preaching is to announce, to announce, to inform, to, to, to share. Uh, in this case, it's the good news. It's the gospel of the kingdom that we, we want to tell people. We need to tell people. And teaching is helping people understand the implications of it, how it applies to your life, my life, why it makes a difference. And it's, it's, it's just basic thing of being a teacher, explaining stuff, right? And so uh, this is for you and I. This is, a, this is a principle that I would suggest that you grab a hold of this because it's, it's for anybody who's a servant of the Lord. Would you go, I'm, you know, I think Sam prayed, you know, we serve you, Lord. We want to we please you. We want to be about your kingdom, your purposes. Okay, so if that's, if that's you, this is directed to you from, from Paul. A servant of the Lord must, must not quarrel. I realize sometimes, you know, you get in conversation with people, they believe different things, and it's, you know, there's a little bit sometimes inside of us that we just go, you know, I want to smack this guy down. I mean, not literally, but, you know, you want to you win the argument. You know, and he's going, no, 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 that's not, that's not what it's about. You've heard the expression that a person persuaded against their will is of the same opinion still. In other words, if you, you might win the argument, but if, if it's done with that kind of a contentious thing, it's like, th- you didn't change their mind. You, you might have had a better argument for them, but they're, they're, they still believe the same stuff. That's not what we're about. He says, we're to be gentle to all. 
Now, you realize that there are some people that you're going to encounter in life that don't agree with you, and he says, well, be gentle with them. I mean, do you see what's going on in our culture? If you have a different opinion, it's like, you're ah! screaming, and yelling, ah, you're crazy. And he says, no, that's not us. So we, we, we can be gentle and respect people and realize this, we want to reason with people if they're willing to reason, talk, you know, discuss, have conversation. Sometimes they're not willing to do that. Okay, well, we're not into quarreling. That's not what it's about. We need to be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. Teaching, teaching is a challenging profession. Uh, I, you know, I was trained as a teacher. My wife's uh, you know, in education and know a bunch of teachers. Uh, there's some really great teachers. They, they, they know the content, they know the material, but they also find ways to, you know, to engage the students. That's part of being a good teacher. You get the students involved to where they actually enjoy learning and they want to learn. That's, that's, that's a good teacher because that doesn't, students don't always come with that kind of attitude. They come sometimes like, I don't want to be here and I don't want to learn anything. It's like, oh gosh, that's hard to reach those guys. But some teachers can do that. And you think about it, I'm teaching. I want the person to get the content, but I want them to see how it implies and how it connects with their life. And that's, that's part of teaching. He says, you should be able to teach. Doesn't mean you've got to be a you know, teacher, pastor, teacher kind of thing, but just, just communicating the gospel to people and helping them see and understand what it means. Because there is darkness. There is tremendous ignorance when it comes to the Bible. More so now in our culture than ever before in our culture. Because... We have generations of young people that have not been raised in Sunday school, not in church. They don't know the Bible stories that some of you guys grew up with and the lessons that you've heard over. They don't, they don't know any of that stuff. And so, serving the Lord must be able to teach, be able to be patient with people. Because sometimes they don't get it. They don't get it the first time. They don't get it the second time. They don't get it the third time. You don't flunk them. You know, you go, no, I'm uh, patient with them and help them come along, right? And in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. He's not saying, if they're wrong, let them be wrong. He's saying, no, it's got to be a humility thing. Not a, I'm over you and I'm going to correct you. But coming from that place of servant, servant, servanthood where you're saying, I want to help you. I'm here to help you. And so I want to help you understand this. And the hope is that you'll see the error and be corrected so that God might perchance, uh, those who are in opposition, they're actually opposed. And because we, want grant God, we hope that God will grant them repentance. That they would turn from that position, turn from that, that attitude, turn from that uh, conviction and, and turn towards the Lord. And that they would know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. Having been taken captive by him to do his will. Now, this does not mean that they're Satan worshipers or anything like that. It means that when you believe something, you act upon that. And if it's an error, if it's a, a deception, a misrepresentation of God or a misrepresentation of the, the morality, the truth, the righteous path, and you go, and I'm acting on that, then you're actually opposing God. You're, you're really serving the adversary who's lied to you. And he's going, don't you want to help people get out of that? hope that by your gentle uh, reasoning with them that they would come to their senses and go god why did they think that that's uh, that's so wrong and that they would be able to escape escape the snare of the devil it, it's obvious when we think about these things two things that come to mind first is that the, there's no substitute for living in a manner worthy of the gospel right there's no substitute some people will say well i just i just live as a witness of course. I mean, what's the alternative? I'm going to live as an anti-witness? No. No, you're, you're the light of the world. You're, there's no substitute for this. But let's not stop there. We're, we're not encouraged to stop there and say, this is what I do. This is what God wants. I, I'm supposed to be a witness. Yeah, that also involves speaking. All right? Jesus calls us to follow him and he says, if we follow him, he will make us fishers of men. And you, and you watch and you go, Jesus, they went to people. They talked to people. Yes, they lived as a good witness in their lives, but they also spoke openly, preaching and teaching the word of God. 
and preach the gospel, teach biblical truth uh, for ourselves, for our immediate sphere of influence as we have opportunities, for our families, for the next generation, the generation after that. We want them to, to be develop deep, lasting, scripture-saturated faith. In other words, stuff that's biblical faith because we've poured into their lives biblical truth. Verses 23 and 24 uh, he, he, Jesus went around and don't miss this. The scripture says that he came to destroy the works of the devil. It's an expression of God's heart towards the suffering of humanity. He cares about people hurting and suffering. He healed all kinds of sicknesses, all kinds of diseases among the people. So he went, he saw people who were hurting and he helped them. Now, you may not have the ability to do that. But you can help. You may not be able to fix somebody's uh, physical ailment, sickness, but you could pray for them, because God might. And even if he doesn't, you can display the compassion of God. You can say, you know what, God really cares about what you're going through. He understands this, this is painful, this has caused sorrow. Uh, we're going to see the word torment that comes up, because sometimes that's part of illness. And that God does care. And he's brought you to that person to say, you know, I just want you to know that God really knows what's going on with you and he cares. And I'm going to ask you, he might heal you because sometimes he'll do that. And I don't have the ability. I'm, I don't have the power. It's not my power to do that. But I want you to know, as I represent him, he loves you. And he cares about what you're going through. His fame went through all Syria, throughout all Syria. They brought him all sick people, afflicted with various diseases and torments. Uh, and Jesus healed them, even those who were demon-possessed. Now, it, it's not common for uh, the average believer to encounter somebody who's demon-possessed and have to deal with it. But something that's far more common is the fact that we do live in a world where the Scripture says that we, we, do, we wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual forces of wickedness in high places. So there, there is spiritual demonic activity in our world. Maybe not somebody that you meet, a human being is possessed, but you certainly will encounter people who are being oppressed by demonic suggestion and influence. Sometimes they're in people who've been involved in drugs heavily or alcohol heavily or other types of really deep stuff. And you start to minister to them. And you guys, some of you guys that are in recovery, you know you've encountered these guys and you go, man, there's, there's, this is more than just a chemical addiction. There's other stuff going on behind here. And that, that's the gospel has the power to free people. That's what Jesus did. He addressed that, and you can address it in prayer and, and the, the sharing of God's word and go, you know what, bro? And, and, and I wish, I wish every time that we did encountered people like that that we could see them always walk in victory. But, you know, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they go back. They, they fall into temptation. They go back down that path. Sometimes they even go back and they perish in that. But that doesn't mean that you, you don't have the ability to help. That doesn't mean you shouldn't share the love of God, that you shouldn't pray for people, that you, you shouldn't uh, address those spiritual forces and go, you know what, God, I ask you to rebuke these things because this guy has got stuff going on in his life that he, it's bigger than him. Jesus has the power over those things. You know, but he does. Uh, epileptics, paralytics, he healed them all. And part of this is, Jesus has absolute authority and power. He, there's nothing that's too difficult for him. Now, that, that's not us, right? But, but we can ask, and he may deliver people. We've seen people get healed supernaturally, just amazingly, and you go, I wish I could do, see that happen all the time, but I don't have the power. And that's okay to admit that to people. Sometimes it's hard to go, hey, you know, I can't fix you. But, you know, God has the power, and he might. He's good, and we want you to trust him regardless, but we're going to pray and ask him to do that because who knows? There's nothing too difficult for him. And I don't mind asking my father in heaven to, to show his love towards you in this specific way. He's already shown his love by sending his son for you to, to save you. So uh, let's pray. And, and if nothing happens, don't you think that person is still better off? Because you were there in compassion and love and saying, I care about you. I care what you're going through. I, you know, I would do anything to help you. If I, what I have in my ability, in my power, I will try to help you. And don't you think that's comforting? 
I mean, it doesn't fix everything, right? But even these people, they, they all died eventually. It didn't, it didn't you know, fix everything. It's like, no, it, it, Jesus helps us. And so I'm just encouraging you guys to not be intimidated by those things. You go, well, I, you know, I don't have the power to deliver people from demons. I, I, I don't either. He does, and he might use you, or he might not. He might have you just pray and love and share and tell them about, point them to the Savior. Okay, verse 25, he says, Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, Judea. You know, a lot of people followed because they, they understood that there was the love of God was being displayed through his life, and they, they wanted to be, a, they were drawn to it. So here's the challenge part. Read this first paragraph, if you would. Um, I'll read it out loud, but you can follow on. Study, recent study conducted by LifeWay Research found that 80% of people who t- attend church one or more times a month believe they have a personal responsibility to share their faith. How many of you guys attend church m- one or more times a month? Okay, uh, okay, so that's pretty much all of us, okay? So, out of that group, if we were, if we were average, right? And that's my, I, my hope and my prayer is, God, please don't let us be an average church. But if we were average, that means 80% of you would believe and say, I believe I have a personal responsibility to share my faith. That's a good thing. I don't know about the other 20% of you, why you don't think you have that responsibility, but 80% do. But then read the next paragraph. Yet, despite this conviction, 61% have not told another person about how to become a Christian in the last six months. You see, that's a, that's a disconnect that is somehow, for some reason, for maybe many reasons, is part of our contemporary American Christianity. We go to church, and that is the basic sum total of our Christianity. So, well, no, but I live as a witness. Okay, I, that's awesome. <laughs> Way better than the alternative. But didn't we read that if we follow Jesus... He will make us fishers of men. If, if I haven't even cast the net out once in six months, I don't call that fishing. All right? I mean, it'd be like uh, when I was a little kid, we used to practice casting. You know, this is the different kind of fishing, but we would ca- practice casting because, we, you know, kids always make a big mess of reels and stuff. So we'd practice casting. We'd get a fishing pole, a little reel, and we'd put a lead sinker, sometimes a rubber sinker, so we wouldn't break any windows. You know, but we'd put something on there heavy so we could you know, cast it out there. If I took that and threw it into the lake, I would not call that fishing. There's no chance I'm going to get a fish. I'm not really seriously fishing. And if we're not casting our net out, even if 60% of us aren't even... In, in six months. Now, it doesn't say that you have to lead somebody to the Lord. It means that you didn't even have a conversation about it. In six months. I'd say there's a problem. If Jesus said he's going to make us fishers of men if we follow him, and yet more than half of the church that comes pretty regularly isn't even talking to somebody and starting a conversation and getting to share the gospel, I'd say we've got a problem. Paul said it in, in this way, addressing this simple kind of a principle. He says, if you, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. Not even once in six months. I think that qualifies as sparingly. But if you sow abundantly, you reap abundantly. You, you, you know from the parable of the sower that there's a variety of different responses to the gospel. Sometimes you share the gospel and it just it hits like hard ground and it doesn't have any impact at all. And sometimes it hits, and, and then there's an initial response, but it's not everything you would hope for, and they fade away. Sometimes it falls, and people get all caught up in the worldly stuff, and they, they walk for a while, and then they just kind of drift off in, back in the world. And so it's, it's not saying you have to dictate the results. It's putting the emphasis on us being fishers of men, to fish. Right? The, the response is his. And so these are some simple thoughts that I want to challenge you with, and then we'll close. And you're going to get out of here early. 
Some of you guys are going, awesome. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe so. Okay. So if you're the light of the world, you and I are called the light of the world. Think about this. Jesus moved to Capernaum and lived there. That means he had a place to stay. He either rented a home or somebody lent him a home. But he was, he was living in Capernaum. What, what kind of neighbor do you suppose he was? I mean, think about it. You know, it's like he, God clearly cares about neighbors because he tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves. So do you suppose Jesus was a pretty good neighbor to have? I, I, would, I would think he's the best neighbor you could possibly have. So what kind of neighbor are you? Am I? Do people see the light of God in us? Or do we, you know, act pretty much like other people? And I, I'm not, I don't know you guys, so I'm not, I mean, I'm not picking on you or anything, but, you know, you ever had neighbors that are difficult? I'm the only one? <laughs> no, no, no. No, it's, it's probably because I'm the difficult neighbor, but, you know, you know, there's times when you have a temptation to say, that guy's a jerk, I'm going to be a jerk back to him. Is that the light of the world? Is, I mean, because that's not what Jesus said, right? He said, you know, do good to those who despitefully use you. You know, you go, oh, yeah, okay. So do they see the light in us, the, the light of Jesus Christ in us, that we're representing him, that people would notice, say, you know what, you're different. You, you, you know, the best neighbor I've ever had because, I mean, you actually care about us and you try to be sensitive to us, and it's like, wow. Because we are. We're called to be the light of the world, to let people see our good deeds and glorify him, not us. All right? And... So what kind of neighbors are we? That's a practical thing. Paul talked about it. You say, well, I don't have to be, I don't have to be concerned about it. Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might win some. It's like, oh, lay down some of my personal indulgences or, you know, things that are preferences or things like that. No, if, if laying that down gives me the opportunity to have, uh, to fish and to share with this guy, I'll, I'll, do it. I'll sacrifice anything for that. To give up any personal privileges that I'm entitled to, but I, I just want to so that I might somehow reach them. That was Paul's attitude. All right? And just being honest, just being transparent with you guys, there's times when I read stuff in the Bible that I, I, I kind of go, yeah, I wish, I wish it was that easy for me. You know, you think about the disciples and you think, well, of course, they're, they're traveling all around. They have no responsibilities. Just do what Jesus says, you know. They don't have to go to work. They don't have to do this. They don't have to deal with kids or grandkids or, you know, college debt or any of that kind of stuff. I got all those responsibilities, you know. I, that's just, this doesn't apply to me. And we can excuse ourselves by saying, well, you know, that's, that's nice for them, but, you know, I'm, I live in a real world. Well, no, you're probably not going to be one of those people who's going to travel all around and just, just be full-time, 24-7, sharing the gospel with people. But don't, don't, you, don't you understand? Don't you understand that God's strategically placed you? It, it's not by accident that you are where you are or that you have the sphere of influence that you have. God's strategically placed you in those places and he... He wants to use you to be a fisher of men in your area, in your connections, uh, your relationship, your family, your neighborhood, your community. You, you think of all the, I mean, some of us have maybe smaller connection groups or smaller worlds in a sense, but some of us got some pretty big ones. You know, I'm involved in the soccer league over there and the, the kids' basketball league over there and I'm doing this over here and PTA and all this. It's like all of those are little areas of influence. You're in all of those. You have relationships with all those people. Maybe some of them are strained because you haven't been light. But maybe some of them are really powerful because you have been light. And God's going, hey, I want you to make a fisher of men. Follow me, the Lord says, follow him, and he will make you a fisher of men. How do I reach those guys? Lord, show me how. How, how do I bring up, start this conversation? There's a I, I'm, I'm not an outgoing person. You may not get that because I stand up in front of you and it's like, if it wasn't for the Lord, I would absolutely never do this. Seriously, before I got saved, this is the most terrifying thought in the world, to stand up in front of people and talk. But God 
gives us the opportunity to tell people about him. And, and there's nothing I'd rather do than talk about him. But if you take me to a social setting, I can easily, like a party or something like that, I can easily go sit in the corner and not talk to a single person and be perfectly fine. I don't feel lonely. I don't feel rejected. You know, I'm just totally fine. But there are times when I go to places like that, I would prefer that, and the Lord points to a person and says, that person really needs to talk. Okay, so I'll go up and start a conversation with them. I'm probably not, like, smooth with the, the start of the conversation, you know? So, but, you know, it, once we start talking about the Lord, it's like, it's, it's, that's, it's like that's what it's all about. And so when I come across guys that are encouraging when it comes to evangelism, I, I try to grab them because I, I, I need that kind of encouragement. And one of the guys that I've gotten a lot from is a guy named Mark Cahill. And his book called One Thing You Cannot Do in Heaven. And it, it's, pretty, it's a pretty encouraging, challenging book because he says, you know, there's a lot of things that we do as Christians that we can do here and we will be able to do there. We can, we can worship here and we can worship there. We can pray here. We can pray there. We can study the Bible here. We can study the Bible there. We can fellowship here. We can fellowship there. But there's one thing that you can't do in heaven. You can never share the gospel with a person who doesn't know Jesus. You can only do that here. He says, I'm certain, from his own experiences, I'm certain that when we stand before the Lord, there are many of us who will say, I didn't share the gospel enough. But there's not one person who's going to say, I shared it too much. Because you can't share it too much. But our temptation, our danger, our risk, obviously if 60% of the visible church hasn't even spoken once in six months about the gospel, there's going to be a lot of us that go, I, I should have spoken more. And I, I want to challenge you guys, especially if you're locals, but also this goes for you if you're a visitor. Think of your community, your circles, your spheres of influence, whatever you're going to call it, and, and realize that God's called you to speak to that community, to that group, to that sphere of influence. And for us who live here, to speak to this mountain, not, not the mountain, the rocks, but to this place, to, to share the gospel. And, and, you know, think of shaking the place, rocking this world, rocking your world, because it's your, your sphere of influence is your world. It's not my world. I'm, I probably don't know half the people, 90% of the people in your world, but you do. And God's called you to be a witness, a fisher of men in that area, that region, that sphere of influence. Uh, you think of the whole valley. If you want to take the whole valley and say, like, I'm considering this to be my world, awesome. You know, if you say, well, I just Big Bear Lake or Big Bear City or my neighborhood or Sugarloaf or uh, who would take Sugarloaf? I live there. I better take it. You know, but Fonskin, Baldwin Lake, Irwin Lake, Boulder Bay, wherever it's like, oh, I, was, I need to speak to this place or your word, your truth. With your leading, not, not just presumptuously and, you know, in my own, but to follow his lead. I say, God, you called me to be a fisher of men in this area. The Bible tells us in Proverbs that he who wins souls is wise. Because it, it means that we understand God's passion for the lost. And so we're participating with him, we're walking with him. He says, that's really wise. That's a wise thing for you to do. I think of Pentecost. Uh, we, we covered it a couple weeks ago. You know today is Pentecost Sunday? Anybody? Oh, wow, we're clearly not Pentecostals. Pentecost Sunday, um, and it's, you know, it's the traditional remembrance of Pentecost, of Jewish celebration, Shavuot, uh, but it's also the celebration for us of the birth of the church. You know, the Holy Spirit being poured out, tongues of fire, all those kind of things. And we see the disciples after Pentecost, just a few days later, it's in chapter 4, so it's very close to the day of Pentecost, that the uh, religious authorities told them, you must stop talking about Jesus. Or we're going to imprison you, we're going to hurt you, we're going we're to torture you. And they thought about it and they said, well, you guys can decide for yourself what you want to do, whether you should listen to men or listen to God. But as for us, 
we're going to listen to God, and we can't stop speaking about him. You see how it's weird that our culture has convinced too many of us that the best thing we can do as a Christian is not talk to anybody, not share the gospel. And yet that's exactly what God wants us to do. He, he says if we follow Jesus, he will. He will make us fishers of men. And we can't stay silent. We have to fish. It means casting out the net of the gospel. And it's, the, even the imagery is, is awesome because it's, it reflects the gen, gentleness of God. The net goes out and it's being drawn in as people are being drawn into, or drawn to the Lord. And that's, that's our job, to cast that net out. And if you go, well, I'm not very good at it. Okay, question. Do you know the gospel? Can you explain it to somebody? Can you tell somebody? Because, you know, it's one thing to have it here. It's another thing to be able to get it come out here. All right? So you go, okay, yes, because obviously if you're a Christian, you know the gospel. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you probably could get to be able to express it. And if not, then work on that. Say, How do I say it? How do I, you know? Practice makes perfect. The more you practice this, the better you will get at it. The more you do it, the better you will have experience. It's like skillful in doing it. And God will help you because he's the one you want to follow and let him make you that fisher of men. Um, okay, so here's the last thing. And really, I probably said I was going to be quitting a couple times, but I, I really mean it this time. <laughs> doesn't mean I didn't mean it last time, but I really mean it. This time. Okay, so what's going to be different? In, at 12.05, what's going to be different for you? Because if you don't determine some way you're going to change, then you know nothing is going to change. Right? And, and when we do that, I, you know, I don't know if you want to respond to the message or not. I hope you do. But if, if you want to respond to the message, responding to the message is not saying, yeah, that really, that, well, I, I need to do something about that. Because you know what happens. You go out the door, and then next week you go, oh, I think I was supposed to do something about that message last week. See, that's, that's where the seed hits the hard soil, and the devil comes along and removes it right away so that it doesn't have opportunity to take root in your life. And my hope as a, as a pastor and as your brother would be, I, I, I hope you don't do that. But what's going to be different? How are you gonna, how's, it gonna, how's it going to change? I can, I can give you one simple way, and this is totally my manipulation, so you don't have to respond to it. But what if you just said, you know, I want, I'm going to share the gospel with somebody every day, this week, and going forward, every day I'm going to look for the, It doesn't mean you'll get the opportunity to have the full gospel share, because some people don't want to hear it. But see, what a difference it would make if you go, today I'm going to share the gospel with somebody. Tomorrow I'm going to share the gospel with somebody. The next day I'm going to share the gospel with somebody. And see, then you go, I'm, I'm committed to following Jesus and letting him show me where to, I'm going to fish. And I'm going to do that. Because if, if you don't, then we could be here a year from now and going, 60% of the church isn't sharing the gospel the last six months. And you go, yep, that's me. Uh, and I don't want that for you. I don't want us to be that kind of church. I can't make that change, but I'm praying that God will do that in our, in our lives because if we sow abundantly, we reap abundantly. God's going to see, you're going you're to see people come to the Lord because of your witness, your fishing, and you won't take credit for it. You won't be going, yeah, I'm awesome. You'll be going, Lord, it's so cool that you can use me. And he does. He wants to use us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your great love and patience with us. And Lord, again, as I, I think about this message, I think I can't help but think about the guys who came to me. Lord, They, they didn't uh, wait for me to go to church. They came to me, and they shared about you, and, and they were patient, and they were humble, and they were all those things. And, and Lord, they just planted seeds in my life, and they were so patient waiting on me to... to figure things out to hear your voice and and lord thank you for using them and thank you lord for your spirit calling me to you i thank you lord for your great amazing grace lord i pray that you would stir hearts uh, to love you to to want to just follow you jesus and 
And Lord, that you would work in them and make them fishers of men. They'd be amazed at, at what you're doing in their lives. They would see the fruit that comes from them just responding to your leading. And Lord, that uh, you might make many in this group soul winners. Not, not by their efforts, Lord, but by simple obedience to you. And you, they'd be able to see you working to save the lost as you came to seek and to save those who are lost. And you're still in that business, Lord. And we're so grateful that you are because that's the very reason we're here. So thank you, Lord. Pray you'd bless, uh, bring this to fruition, to fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.